The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So hi everybody, it's Anthony. Uh, it's uh, Anthony here. So um, uh, we'll, we'll actually wait for two or three minutes more to wait a bit for people, and then uh, we'll start the, the webinar. So I'll actually buy, you know, go to mute for now to avoid uh, being annoying, and uh, I'll uh, switch my mic to on again in two or three minutes, and then we'll start the webinar. So actually, maybe uh, you know, for the time that we're waiting, I can actually light on my camera for a couple of seconds just for you to show who you're talking to. Um, so I have no clue if you see me, um, but it's uh, it's Anthony from from the working in Paris in the Sigfox team. Uh, so as you can see, we are in the Sigfox office uh, in the Paris office, and I will uh, I will have to cut my 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 camera because the Wi-Fi is not very good, so you can at least hear me correctly. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to say hi to everybody. If you, if you went to an event or something like that, there is a big chance you already saw me. Uh, so hi to everybody who already know me. So I'll switch off my camera again. Okay, so now we are at 40 people, so we'll, uh, we'll start. So let me remove that thing. Um, So um, the, the idea about this webinar was to do an introduction of the key components and the functions of Sigfox hardware. So you know we, we didn't want to repeat us again and introduce what is Sigfox and blah blah blah. So in this webinar, you will learn you know what are the key components in a Sigfox device, how to choose them, what are the possibilities, uh, and what are your options. Of course, we can't be, you know, we can't tell you everything in half an hour, 45 minutes. So you will always, you know, you will only get an introduction to it and you will have links to follow up on everything that you will hear about. Uh, but the whole idea was really to, to give you an overview about what's happening behind the hood and, and inside the device. Um, so this is not uh, a webinar for complete beginners uh, because then, you know, you will actually get into trouble, uh, but it's a webinar for people who want to know more about Sigfox uh, and understand how it works in, in the hardware part. So we'll start by an introduction, of course. What uh, you know about what is Sigfox? Uh, you know uh, uh, what is the hardware, how it works, etc. Then we'll go to key components in details, explaining you component by component uh, what are your options, what are the, the best uh, you know that you can choose how to choose them, et cetera, uh, and the feedback we have. Uh, and, you know, hopefully you will get a better understanding on how you make your choices for future designs. And then, you know, a very quick um, start on how to get started to, to follow up on what we just said. So first, the introduction. Um, so just to remind you, what is Sigfox? Because to talk about the device, we have to, to, to actually position it in the value chain on a Sigfox uh, solution. So the device is at the complete beginning of the value chain. Uh, so basically with Sigfox, you know, we develop IoT networks. So, you know, we, we deploy antennas it's everywhere to, to get this network up. In this chain, the device is at the complete beginning. So the device will basically wakes himself up, emits a radio message, 
which will be understood by the antenna, which are on high point buildings, etc. These antennas will send that to the Sigfox cloud, process it, and then will push that to your custom to your backend. So that's how Sigfox works, the whole chain. So to do a focus on the device itself, what does it how does it look like on the device itself? So it's actually almost all the devices work exactly the same. First, the device you know wakes himself up, so it's powered by the battery. Second thing is that it will send something interesting to say. And when I say send something, it can be everything. You know, we'll talk about later about what kind of sensor you can have, but basically it will send for something. It could be GPS position, temperature, humidity, it can be an alarm, a button, whatsoever. Then the device will process the data, the raw data, and transform it into comprehensible data for, for the network. And then the last part of the device is that it will send this data to the Sigfox radio to be sent to the, to the, to the network. So um, all the devices work exactly the same way. Uh, so first, power on. Second thing, send something. Third thing, analyze the data and transform it. And for, fourth, send it to Sigfox. That's pretty much uh, it on the logic part. The, the next slide is about you know, all these devices which you can see on the screens are actually very different in terms of use case, in terms of solutions. You know, you have a parking sensor at the top left, you have a concrete sensor in the middle, a GPS tracker, I mean Voxia at the bottom middle, uh, you know, a swimming pool monitoring system, you have the sensor. So all these solutions are, are targeted to have very, very different solutions. You know, uh, one is in the water, the other one is CO2, et cetera. Uh, so they serve different purposes. But what you have to understand is that from an hardware perspective, they are actually kind of quite similar. Uh, and, and, and for that, we'll look into what, what the Sensit is about. You know, the Sensit is a, a small device that uh, we actually do, uh, Sigfox does, for marketing purposes. You know, we sell it as a solution to, do, to start with the IoT. You can just buy it and have fun with it. And so this is a really, really good example to explain you what the device is about. Because as I said, all the devices you've seen before are actually based on the kind of same model. You know, you have exactly the same key component to make a Sigfox device work uh, in a Sigfox device. So first, of course, you, you know, uh, you have the casing. Uh, if we want to do a comparison with a, a human body, it will be your skin, you know. The casing, your plastic, usually around the device to make it, you know, waterproof or to make it, uh, you know, um, durable. So usually it's plastic, it can be metal, it can be aluminum, etc. For radio purposes, we'll talk about it later, it's not optimal, but it can be different kind of thing. We have, we have actually devices which are made of wood. The casing is made of wood, it's really nice. So it can be a different thing. Then inside, you have a battery. The battery uh, is, uh, in let's say 95% of the case, uh, is in a Sigfox device. The battery will actually power up the device and give you enough power to power a device for days, months, or sometimes even years. Um, so most of our devices are powered by battery. Some of devices which are working on Sigfox network are powered by you know, regular plugs, but it's really, really exceptional cases. Most of our Sigfox devices are powered by the battery. Then you have the sensors. Uh, you know, sensors can be anything, and we'll see a bit. We'll see that a bit later. But when I talk about sensors, I talk about um, finding something interesting to say. Uh, so I, you know, uh, temperature, humidity, but it can also be a GPS data. You know, GPS position is interesting, and so it's a, we, we talk about that so like a sensor. Wi-Fi can be a sensor, etc. So you have always sensors inside. Then you have a microcontroller. The microcontroller is, you can, if you think about that as a kind of similar as your laptop, the microcontroller is a CPU, uh, you know, the brain of your devices. It's him who will understand the data and transform it into comprehensible data for, for, your, for your network. So it will be the, really the brain of your device, uh, you know, lighting on uh, different sensor, uh, doing the translation, etc. Then in this device, you have the Sigfox modem, of course, because to talk about, to talk, you know, in, in the Sigfox, let's say the Sigfox languages, you need to have a part which is uh, the Sigfox modem. 
and then you have the antenna. Uh, so you will see a bit that, uh, that a bit later, but we actually tend to forget that. But every single wireless device has antennas. It can be your phone, it can be your watch, uh, anything which is wirelessly connected, connected has an antenna. It's often embedded, so we tend to forget them. Uh, uh, but for Sigfox, it's very important. So that's why we spend a lot of time today on it, because it's key. So I just wanted to just show you a bit better what it looks like. What it looks like. So this is the Sensit. The Sensit is the marketing device that we use again, as I said. Uh, so this is just what we call the PCB of the Sensit. So we literally open the casing, and this is what was under it. Um, so we'll start, you know, from the top. And what you can see on the top is actually an antenna. It can seem really weird to you, uh, but this is what we call a PIFA antenna. So you know. A planar, um, planar antenna, which is a, literally just a you know, metal which is bent. Uh, this is very, very efficient antenna, uh, and it's actually open source on, on the internet now. We, we published it. Um, and so this is a really, really particular and really good antenna to actually work with Sigfox. Just under it, as you can see, you can see the battery connector. So the battery is not on this picture because usually it's under the PCB. So actually it was hidden here. But the, the idea is that you will actually connect a battery uh, under it. It's a really, really small, really slim. I think it's 500 milliamps. Um, so, and this battery can go up to one month of battery life. So it's uh, very, very efficient in terms of battery life. The third thing, uh, so you can't see here because it's hidden with a metal casing. It's all the radio components. Uh, so this is, the Sensit is quite particular because it can talk in different Sigfox languages with different Sigfox zones. Um, and so under this you know, part of metal, actually we'll find all the necessary components to make that possible. So this is really complex and so this is where it's hidden. Just under you have the magnet uh, to actually sense if the door is open or not. So this is a magnet sensor. Then at the bottom you have the transceiver, CC1125. So this is the Sigfox modem part. Uh, so this is you know where the Sigfox magic happened, and then at the complete extreme le uh, left is the MCU, the STM32. So from ST Micro is your brain. So here on this sensor, it will do everything needed to actually control the device, send the, the send the, the data, etc. So this is the, the brain of the device. And again, uh, almost all devices we're working with Sigfox uh, are built this way. An antenna, you know, uh, a modem, you have a microcontroller, sensors, a battery, a casing, etc. So it is really important to understand that uh, you you can actually build a device with this kind of schematic. So first, uh, we wanted to talk about the casing because uh, casing is really really important, especially with uh, connected devices with IoT, because casing uh, is a can be a really, really big problem. If you, if you, if you want to do a really performing, uh, well-performing IoT device, you have to consider casing very, very early in your design. Uh, if you take just the smallest form factor, if you take you know, the cheapest uh, uh, casing on the, on the market, or if you, do, if you 3D print something uh, that is really nice, but not really uh, good for performance, you can run into trouble. So as I write in my, in, my, in my slides, the casing is completely depending on the use case. Uh, you have to think about what you want to achieve with it before to actually buying something. Do you want it to be waterproof? Do you so IP something? Uh, does it need to have some size requirements? Because of course, the smallest possible, the, you know, the toughest part is the tough, toughest is to, to develop. Um, so you have a lot of questions to answer before to select the good one. However, there is some rules uh, which are always true. Uh, so this is some of the tips that we wanted to give you today. Is that, of course, you know, uh, doing Sigfox is a radio protocol. So uh, radio uh, hates one thing: it's metal. So always consider plastic uh, before metal for your casing. I know you can sound stupid for people who do that since a long time, but. Uh, for people who don't know that, it's really, really important. So always consider plastic uh, before metal. 
A second advice would be to consider what we, what we call shelf, shelf casing. Um, shelf casing means that you can go into distributors, online retailers or whatsoever, to buy casing which are already done in high volumes and that you don't have to completely build yourself again. Uh, so this is actually a really good solution that we used for years for our Sensit. Uh, we were buying the, you know, the, the, the casing uh, and, uh, and uh, one of our provider. And it was way, way more interesting from a finance perspective than doing all. So maybe buying actually a uh, casing online or something would be, would be the best way for you. And the last point of advice, and this I will <laughs> insist on it for a long time, but everybody who wants to work with Sigfox says, okay, I want a smallest device possible. I want, you know, something I can use everywhere, etc." So they want the smallest one. But that's not how it works, because of course, the smallest you want to achieve, the more problem you will run into. Uh, if, you, if you have a bigger uh, device, you can have a bigger size for your antenna, you have a bigger size for your PCB, you have a bigger size for everything, so it's easier. So again, don't aim for the smallest device, aim for the use case. If you are tracking industrial containers, you have a lot of space, do a big device. If you are like, doing a CO2 sensor, that you, you, know, you can hide somewhere, do a big device. Don't worry about the size. If you, know, uh, if you aim at doing a consumer GPS tracker, for example, on your keychains or whatsoever, here size matters. So of course, do as small as you can. But don't, by default, aim for the smallest device possible because you will run into trouble and it can, it can, you can actually ruin your device. So be careful with that. So, after casing, uh, batteries. Batteries, of course, are the most, one of the most important components of your device because it will tell you how long your device can last in the wild. Uh, Sigfox is really famous, is a very, really famous network for having devices which can go, you know, uh, can run up to 10 years of battery life. Uh, so it's possible, of course, but it's, you know, uh, everything depends on the battery you want to choose. Uh, you can't run 10 years over one single you know, AA battery. It can't work like that. So what is good about Sigfox as well is that it's very predictable. Uh, you know, if you compare to other, let's say, kind of networks, which are uh, depending on how far you are from the antenna, uh, how far you want to, you wanna, the, how strong you want to send your message, etc., cetera, um, you will never consume the same amount of battery. With Sigfox, it's the opposite. You will always, and I say always, consume the same amount of battery when you send a Sigfox, device, a Sigfox message. So it may, if you are really close to an antenna, if you are really far from an antenna, uh, if you are inside, outside, etc., your message will consume exactly the same amount of, of power. And this is really, really important to calculate how long your battery will last. So this is really important to understand that uh, calculating Sigfox bat device battery life is very, very easy comparing to other type of networks. Of course, uh, which is what which was true for you, the casing is also true for the batteries. Uh, different type of battery life of battery are actually done for different kind of use case. Um, some people can recharge the device, so it's actually maybe better to go for a rechargeable, uh, rechargeable light, uh, lithium battery. Um, so may, may be the best way. For size, for example, uh, constraint, having a very, very slim uh, lithium is really, really nice. But maybe you can't charge it, so you need real batteries uh, which are a bit bigger, but you don't have to change every month. So, uh, you, know, diff you know, also depending on the use case, the battery are very, very important. If you can charge it, maybe consider lithium. If it's maybe an industrial case where you can't charge a device, you will go for, like, let's say, regular battery to AA, AAAs, etc. And so again, consider the use case uh, uh, before choosing your battery. Just a, a side note, uh, so the peak current. Um, so the peak current, when your device will talk in Sigfox, it will transmit, uh, is a bit different depending on the regions. So we'll see that a bit later. But basically, Sigfox has different radio zones, let's say. And so in Europe, you will emit at some frequencies. In, in the US, for example, you would actually talk with another frequency. And the power is a bit different. So just for you to know, when you are in Europe, depending on the radio modem that you choose, you will 
actually you know, uh, spend between 20 and 50 milliamps in Europe and around 120 to 250 milliamps in the US. However, as you know, in Europe, we'll actually send a bit slower. Uh, so overall consumption between Europe and US is actually kind of similar. So that's a good thing as well about TikTok is that one message sent in US and one message sent in Europe is actually kind of the same power need. So this is very, very important to understand as well. I've put two signs and two, let's say, danger signs at the, on the right of my slides to actually answer two questions I'm always asked. Uh, the first one is about coin cell batteries. Uh, everybody, of course, they want to do Sigfox, so they want to do the smallest device possible. And they ask me about, okay, but can I do a device with my very, very small coin cell batteries? The thing is, yes, you can but uh, you will have really, really short battery life because it, con it will actually consume the power very, very fast. Uh, usually, people who do that work with an extra capacitor with it. Let's solve it's really understand, important to understand. And the second thing to understand is that it's really better to have two batteries uh, in, in, in parallel than only one because the consumption will be way better over time. So if you, can have the ch if you have the choice, I actually prefer multiple batteries over one. Uh, it's actually better. Just for, for you to, just to explain you how different it can be depending on different technologies of batteries and depending on kind of use case, we actually created two completely, you know, example uh, that we, we've done um, just to explain you how it works. So these cases uh, we calculated with two different use cases. The first one is just a, a regular sensor with a Sigfox, uh, uh, a Sigfox module, which will emit 10 messages on, in the uplink per day and one downlink per day. These messages will be six bytes. It will be done with a Zone 4 Wiesel module. So Zone 4 is actually Latin America and in the part of Asia. So um, this is the zone that we're talking about. And the idle plus sensor will be one micro. So we calculated that, and just for you to know, with lithium, with a two ampere hour battery, we arrive at 1,140 days of time, uh, which uh, is around, uh, let's say, a bit, a bit less than three years, I guess, if my calculation are right. And if you take an alkaline with the same amount of voltage, it will actually uh, almost triple. So it will triple to this number. So you can actually reach almost 10 years of battery life. If you go for uh, a Sigfox tracker, so here we don't, on, on, we, we don't, we, we don't send 10 messages, but we send 50 messages per day. So we actually send a lot of messages and we receive one downlink per day. These messages are zero bytes because it's just a tracker enabling with Sigfox, always you know, with the same module, the same sensors, etc. Here, as you send uh, more messages, the, you know, the uptime will be way less. In lithium, it will be 100, around 600 days. And in alkaline, it will be more than you know, 1,000 days. So it's still good. Uh, it's a bit less than three years, but it's always good. So what we wanted to show you here is that your battery, you know, people come to Sigfox and say, hey, I want, a miss I want a device which can go up to 10 years of battery life, uh, which is the smallest possible, and send 140 messages per day, etc. This is not possible. Uh, of course, it's always a trade-off between how many messages you want to send per, per day, uh, you know, how many uh, uh, bytes you want to send in your message, what kind of battery, what kind of type of battery you have, etc. So this is really important to understand that it all depends on the use case and on the type of on the number of messages that you want to send per, per day. So now to sensors. So, uh, you know, sensors are very interesting because <laughs> there is literally millions of possibilities uh, from 20 cent temperature sensor to a couple of thousands of euros, uh, you know, of sensors in agriculture, for example, uh, you have very, very different type of sensors. Um, it is uh, very important to, to, to understand that. The good thing about that is that most of them can be powered by a battery. Uh, so, you know, we can actually embed that into a, a battery, let's, let's say, a, a, bat, a battery powered device. So, a Sigfox device can be uh, battery powered. So, that's good. And uh, most of the ones that we work with can be battery powered. This is very, very important. And the last thing to understand as well with sensors is that usually it's not only one sensor 
which uh, uh, actually solves your solution or your problem. It's usually a combination about multiple sensors, which are which is the best solution for your customers. So uh, we'll talk about it a bit so in the next slide. But uh, in the what are the most used sensor with Sigfox uh, added of the devices for tracking, for example, is very very interesting because uh, people always think about GPS, of course, for tracking sensors. So you put a GPS antenna, a GPS module, and receive GPS uh, uh, GPS coordinates. It's good, but what what happens if you're indoor? Because GPS actually doesn't really work indoor. Some people started to add Wi-Fi uh, chipsets on, in, in in these devices, not to connect to the to the Wi-Fi network, but just as a sensor to sense what kind of Wi-Fi net, wi network are around and send that over Sigfox. So here the Wi-Fi is used as a sensor. And then you have a perfect combination with GPS plus Wi-Fi. Because when you are outside, GPS will get your position. And when you're inside, the Wi-Fi will do. Uh, so you actually, it's a combination of GPS sensor and Wi-Fi sensor. Uh, for tracking, you can also use Bluetooth with Bluetooth beacon. It's also something interesting. And you have a lot of different uh, kind of technologies for tracking uh, sensors. In other kind of sensors, you also have what we call environmental sensors. Uh, so of course, you have the you know, temperature, humidity, uh, CO2 sensors. You have wind sensors. You have you know hundreds of different env environment sensors uh, where you can actually put let's say five, ten of sensors in the same box to understand a lot of different uh, you know um, uh, variants and uh, and actually send that over Sigfox. For alerts, uh, sensors, what we call alerts, uh, there is also a lot of different sensors that you can use. Within Sigfox, we use a lot of different of them, like a magnet, for example, as I explained uh, with the sensors. A magnet can be just understand, uh, can be used if to understand if the door, for example, is open. It can be understood, can be used uh, to see if there is some movement or whatsoever in the drawer. Or... So uh, just a simple magnet can be a very, very powerful sensor. So that's also really important to understand. Uh, a peer, so it's uh, an infrared sensor, is really, really uh, and heavily used in a present sensor to see if somebody is in a room, if somebody goes through, uh, let's say, a, a meeting room or whatsoever. So infrared sensors are very commonly used uh, in, a, in IoT as well, and they are quite cheap as well. So uh, this is really important to, to see. Uh, infrared is really, really good. A button, just a simple button, uh, can also be a very important uh, sensor. It can, it can actually seem stupid, but if you have a problem, having a button that you can push, a send an alert, is very, very important for your use case. The, the last, let's say, groupment of, of sensor that we wanted to talk about is, of course, the movement. Uh, so, and, and there, uh, usually, it's a combination of you know, a lot of different sensors which can give you useful data. So here we talk about accelerometer, barometer, magneto, gyro, etc. But you have a lot of different sensors to understand the movement of a device. And usually, as I said, it's a combination of them. Uh, for example, if you do a GPS device, uh, you will always add an accelerometer to your device. Why? Because you want to understand when the device moves to, to power on your GPS. If you power on your GPS always, you will drain the battery. You want only to light on the GPS when it moves. So you light on the accelerometer. If it moves, you light on the GPS and you save a lot of batteries. So again, you know, sensors are very, very interesting combined and used together. Uh, taking one by one, uh, they are not so interesting. And again, as I said, there is a lot of powers, uh, different types kind of uh, sensors. If you look at a company like Bosch, they literally have thousands of different references, which are very, very interesting. Uh, you know, if you want to take, for example, predictive maintenance, they have a lot of vibration sensors. They have a lot of uh, a, really, really a lot of different ones. So just look at the catalog of these guys, and they have a lot of interesting sensors to be used for, for IoT. So now let's say the most Sigfox part. Uh, I think the question I was asked the most uh, within my start at Sigfox three years ago was, OK, I want to do a Sigfox device. What kind of modem do I put in my, in my Sigfox device? Um, and this is a very important question because this is how you will define your design and how you will build around it, etc. So choosing the right modem for you is very, very important. Before to go directly into details, I just want to say something. 
for people who, who don't really understand our model. Um, so Sigfox modem. There is not such thing as a as a as a Sigfox modem. Let's say Sigfox itself doesn't do uh, hardware. Uh, so we have a, a lot of partners, which are ecosystem partners, that do modems, modules, etc., chipsets which are compatible with the Sigfox network. But Sigfox itself doesn't design it. This is really really important to understand. Uh, as I said in the, in the slide, the stack is free. Uh, Sigfox, if you buy, for example, a, a module at, uh, like Lighton or STMicro, Weisel, which is compatible with Sigfox, Sigfox doesn't take money on that. Uh, there is no IP fee or whatsoever compared to other technologies. The stack, we provide it for free to these guys, they implement it in the modules, and they actually sell it to you. But we don't get any money from that. The last really, really important thing to understand about Sigfox is that you can source components from a lot of different partners. Again, as I said, you can take a Weisel module, you can take a module from Inocom, from Unsimai, from Lighton, Georgin, all the guys you can see on the slides, um, and you can make your own choice. Compared to different technologies which are you know, hardware locked and that belong to one semiconductor, here, this is the complete opposite. We went to a lot of different partners to have very, very different kind of solutions uh, to be the best for customers. So here, you will not be locked with only one hardware vendor if you do Sigfox. Then this is where the fun begins. <laughs> um, actually, to do Sigfox and to, 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 to send a Sigfox message, you have different solutions. Uh, the most, let's say, common use is the module. Uh, what is a module? Uh, it's basically a small chipset that you put on your electronics and that will do all the Sigfox part for you. Uh, you know, there, it's very, very simple to use. So it's only based on Sigfox. You, there is a microcontroller inside. Uh, you can do a lot of things. Uh, and it's already type approved, etc., and certified by Sigfox. And the only thing you have to do and is send one line of code to this module, and it will translate that into a Sigfox messages and send the thing to the antenna, etc. So you literally have nothing to do. You put it on your PCB, send one line of code, and it will do the rest. And this is what we advise people to use, Sigfox modules. Uh, you, will that, you will find that at uh, Inocom, Weisel, again, Georgin, Lighton, Telecom Design, T-Next. Uh, so all these guys, they will provide you really, really good modules. But then again, if you want to do, let's say, huge volumes, uh, or if you, want, if you already have a design based on some transceivers, on SOCs, et cetera, you can also use uh, transceivers. We saw the Sensit a bit earlier, and I talked to you about the CC1125. This is, this is a transceiver. Uh, it's very, very different from a module, because here you will have to implement the Sigfox stack by yourself. This is way, way more complex, uh, and it will take way longer to achieve to a Sigfox design. So I would actually, uh, let's say, uh, not advise you to go through that way, except if you really know what you do. Uh, if you want to start with Sigfox, with even to like you know 10,000 or 50,000 volumes, uh, that kind of thing, uh, you should go for a module. It will be way way easier, way faster, and you will really uh, save money. If you want to do huge volumes like millions, etc., look at transceivers because they might be cheaper on high volumes, etc., but it's very very uh, dangerous. So I apologize for the lack of clarity of this, uh, but that was the, <laughs> the best I could do. Um, it was to explain you the different kind of module that you wanna, you want actually you can buy today on the market, because there is different kind of uh, modules you wanna, you can buy. So the most common part is the one from the left. So what we call the closed modem. Uh, it's as I said, a modem which is you know a closed. You put it on your PCB. You send one line of command, one command line. Um, and it will do the Sigfox magic completely on its own. Of course, the, the downside of that is that you, you need an external microcontroller to manage this module. <coughs> you know, to plug your sensors, etc. you will need an MCU for that. So it will cost you a bit more money, but it will be very, very easy to, to, to use. The second option is to use what we call an open API module. So here you have an SDK, which is provided with the module, and you will be able to embed your own application code into the module itself. Uh, so for example, the 
TD1208R is this way, the Georgian module is this way. There's a lot of modules which are allowing you to put your own code, your very own code, in the, in the module. So here's a good thing is as your code is in the module, you don't have to have an external MCU. Um, so it will save you some cost, but might be tricky to code. So here again, uh, go this way if you know what you want to do, if you know what you want to achieve, uh, but it actually brings more complexity. So be careful if you choose this path. <coughs> Sorry for my cough. And then again, on the complete right of the slide, we have the multi-connectivity modules um, here, which is really, really good because uh, since a couple of months, uh, years, let's say, we started to see module makers implementing different kind of, uh, you know, uh, network connectivity in the Sigfox module. So now we even have modules which have GPS, DLE, or Wi-Fi in the very same module when you have your Sigfox module. So this is really interesting because you will buy only one chipset which does everything. So this is really interesting. Of course, you will have the, you know, you can put your own code in there, so you don't have to have an external MCU, uh, and it's very, very simple to use. So, uh, for example, Inocom and Weisel have these modules, which you have GPS, Wi-Fi, and DLE inside, uh, and it's very, very interesting to use if you want to do, uh, you know, uh, like, for example, a GPS device, you have everything in one chipset. So this is very interesting to look at. So, <clears throat> Um, which one to which one to choose? Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I repeat myself every time on that, but again, it it all depends on the use case. It has no uh, solution which can go everywhere. The important but question that you have to ask yourself when you choose this kind of uh, components is. Do you need an SDK? Do you, do you want to be able to put your own code in the module? Is it important? Uh, do you need other connectivity? Because maybe adding a Bluetooth external is a, is a mess. So maybe you want Bluetooth in the same module. Um, is price a really, really important part for you? If it's really, if it's the case, maybe you have to some, some brand that you can look into. Is power consumption the key for you? Because some modules consume way more than some others. Uh, is it available in the market and what size does it do? I mean, again, this is just a simple question that you have to ask yourself. Uh, but again, every time you want to do a new design, look at what you want to achieve and choose depending on that. Don't choose because of only one. And don't go only for price because you will have problems then with other you know, things. Uh, always look at your best solution for your use case before to, to make any choice. And again, uh, you know, if you, if you, uh, the, uh, I actually put it, uh, uh, a link here. And, uh, and so you can actually see on the partner network every single module that you want to, you can choose from. Uh, so again, you know, the Weisel quad modules with TPS, BLE, etc. Uh, we have a lot of different modules that you can choose from and you will get the link in the presentation to go on the partner network. Uh, you know, so it's very, very simple. You just have to do products, modules, and you will actually find that link. It's very, very important. So back to my slides. <clears throat> Again, uh, as I said a bit earlier, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's a bit complex to understand, so I'm not going to have the time today. But I just want you to understand that uh, some uh, Sigfox is actually divided into uh, five zones now, uh, five radio zones, and uh, so modules will actually target most. Uh, I mean, most of them will only target one zone, one radio zone. So um, it's very important that you understand that if you want to achieve, if you want to do a device, for example, in Brazil or in the US, you have to take an RC RC2 uh, module. If you want to work in Europe and do your device for and target this Europe market, then you have to choose a RC1. Uh, module. Uh, Japan is RC3, South America and part of Asia is RC4. So I'm very sorry, this is a very old slide, so uh, this, if there are some countries are missing and uh, we have updated a bit. But I just wanted, it was just to, to explain you that be careful as well when you choose your module to choose the one for your right radio zone. Of course, some, some modules and some solutions can work everywhere in the world, uh, but it's a bit more complex to, to understand that. 
Uh, and we, have, we will have a webinar dedicated to, to that topic in a couple of weeks. So I'm not going to do any spoilers here. The most important part of a design, as I said earlier, uh, the antenna is the part that you, you, you should spend the most important, I mean, the most uh, amount of time that you can on that. Why? Because it's really funny, but since a couple of years, you know, we, have, we all have phones in our hands, we all have connected smartwatch or connected everything with Bluetooth, etc., and we don't see the antenna. So we forget that we are inside, but you know, you have to remember that any connected device to everything, which is wireless, have antenna. And with Sigfox, it's even more important because uh, usually, you know, with Sigfox, you, the antenna will be quite far, and so you need to reach them. So you always need uh, to have the best performance radio that you can actually you can have. So be careful when you design that and plan it uh, when you do your PCB. Plan it at the very beginning of your device and your design. Of course, uh, the you know you can't be you can't have the best of every of all the world. Uh, the design of an antenna is always a balance between the design and performance. If you want the smallest antenna possible because you need to do a connected watch, uh, it will not be as powerful than an, like a semi-wave antenna, uh, which is like 12 centimeter high. Of course, so it always have to be a balance between performance and the design requirements. It of course also, also depends on the use case you want to achieve because if you want to be off, on top of building, outside, etc., maybe you don't need a great antenna because your use case is outdoor, because your use case is really high, so it's usually points which you have a really, really good coverage of Sigfox network, so maybe you don't need that good antenna because you have you know, a use case which allows it. But for example, if you do water metering, which is, you know, you, which usually devices are five meters deep in the ground. Here, you need the best antenna possible. Uh, so again, it depends on the use case you want to achieve. In theory, we'll, we'll tell you to always go for the best. In practical, some, sometimes uh, you, may, you may not need uh, the best antenna. You only need one antenna that suits your needs. Uh, this advice is maybe the most important advice in the whole presentation, so listen to it carefully. If you have no clue of what an antenna is about, please hire somebody who does. Uh, we've seen, I don't know, maybe not, not hundreds, but dozens of, of companies who failed to do their device because of the antenna. They did their whole design, and at the end, they understood that the, the device was not you know, performing well because of the antenna, and even though we actually told them, they didn't listen, and they still went to a wall. So be careful about that, and hire a guy who knows what they do when talking about. Again, we, if you go to the website of, uh, that we, we launched, uh, build.sigfox.com, we provided you with a really, really nice white paper, which is 41 pages about you know, what, uh, what antennas are about, etc. Uh, so where is it? It's here. Oh, I need to log in, actually, to, to download it. But if you log in, you will be able to download a 41-page white paper about Sigfox antennas, so, which is really, really important. And we even made a video uh, of 12 minutes with our specialist, uh, Cyril, uh, our best antenna guy in, in, in Toulouse, uh, explaining you how to do a, an antenna, explaining you the power emission, etc. So go to these pages, they will tell you everything. Another useful resource is uh, that we open sourced uh, the antenna of the Sensit. The, the antenna that you saw a bit before, we open sourced it completely. So you can download it, look at it, understood how we did things. Uh, the good thing with this antenna is that it's multi-zone, so you can, you can actually target uh, RC1, RC2, RC3, etc. So this is a very good antenna to start from, so, but which need to be used in a certain kind of use cases. Uh, for us, it was you know, the sensitive use case. So look at it, but it's a very, very you know, useful tool to start from. And then again, uh, if you want to learn again more, we've added a, a small link uh, because ST Micro, uh, ST Micro have done a very, very applica good application note about antennas. So you just have to click on this link and it will uh, you know, guide you to this uh, nice application note from, from ST. So uh, go back to the presentation. But so again, the antenna in your device is the most important part. And, and if I go back uh, to, to, the, to the beginning of my slides, uh, I will go back, sorry for that. Well, I wanted to show you this. 
As you can see on this slide, uh, and the antenna is actually a, a big part of the design, even physically speaking, so in the, in the design. So be careful when you design it, uh, because if you leave a very, very small place at the top of your PCB, you will, uh, and you don't really consider it before, you will have problems. So please consider it before. Going back to my, I think, uh, almost final, uh, final slides. So the good thing with antennas is that there is a lot of providers which provide you know, antenna on shelves. What we call on shelves is you can actually buy that from retailers online, etc. Where antennas which are really, really good already. Uh, so from brands like Molex, Pulse, Lynx, uh, a lot of them. Uh, so you, you can also buy directly from them. Of course, you can do your own, as I said again. Uh, you can hire an, a guy which will design you an antenna, you know, completely for you. Uh, but, you know, it's more expensive. So it all depends on what you want to achieve. If you want to achieve very, very small, you might want to hire somebody to design it for you. But then it's really more expensive. So it all depends on your need. Uh, and again, you can see some of the uh, different designs at the bottom of the slide. At the extreme right, you can see a regular, you know, antenna, quarter wave antenna. Uh, then you can see a, a PCB antenna, uh, an helicoidal antenna, and uh, what we call a patch antenna on the complete left. So there is really, really a lot of different kind of designs of antenna, uh, which are very different and which can be used in really different kind of use case. So again, there is one for units for sure. Small feedback on antennas. So I'm not an antenna guy. So this is a feedback I gathered from an antenna, an antenna guy. Um, again, uh, depending on what use case you want to achieve, some antenna technologies are better than others. Of course, if you want to achieve the best performance, external antennas are the best because they are, you know, they, they are big. They can get some gain, etc. So an external antenna is really, really important. Um, an internal wire can be really, really good. Uh, PCB printed as well. Uh, so I will, you will actually get this slide, so no problem. Uh, I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but here is a small feedback, let's say, we wanted to give you regarding technologies, um, just to, to understand. Of course, I mean, this is not, uh, let's say, completely 100% uh, true, because we have people who are designing ceramics antenna and who have amazing performances, because they know what they do. Uh, so this is not completely perfect. We, here, we wanted to give you a, a kind of feedback of what we saw on the field uh, and people in the past. But uh, don't take that as, you know, like, okay, uh, Sigfox said ceramics is bad, so I'm not going to do ceramics antenna. No, 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 don't take it this way. If you know what ceramic antenna is, oh, and you know how to work with them, they, are really, they can be really, really good. But we had some problem with customers who had no idea before, so we just wanted to give you some, some feedback on that. And so how to get started? Um, so I talk a lot, so I'm uh, sorry for that. <laughs> But you can actually think, you can actually find a lot of different, you know, important, let's say, links, etc., on a, on the blog post that we did a couple of weeks ago, which is called "How to Get Started with Sigfox," and that you can actually know uh, everything from. You can actually learn uh, everything that you need. So here, if you want to learn about Sigfox, you can go on Build, uh, you know, the the Build website that we talked, uh, I think, one month ago. We, you know, which we have every, every single, almost every single uh, document that we, we, we designed is here. So that's really, really good. Uh, then how to choose a development kit from Arduino, PyCom, etc. As a dev kit is the best way to start a Sigfox. It's really important to choose from a good one. Then you have how to work with the network coverage, how to do if you don't have network coverage, how to buy connectivity, etc., etc. So, you know, I actually, uh, again, I, uh, the link is in the presentation, so you can find it. But if you, if you, after this presentation, if you want to start with Sigfox and uh, understand how to do it better, you can go this way. So I think I spoke way too much, uh, but so it's okay. <laughs> so maybe we can go to, to question now. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Um, I have put in the chat window for every attendee the, the, sub, the topic of the next webinar, which will be a focus on the SDR dongle, which is the most important tool if you are out of coverage or coming from a country where you don't yet have um, a, a Sigfox network. So you see the link in your chat window. 
I also uh, would love to uh, know how much useful this webinar was for you. So I am launching a quick poll. Um, if you could please answer um, on, on the usefulness of, of such webinar for you, uh, so that we understand if we need to to keep doing this kind of, uh, of webinars, if we need to increase the complexity. And next, we will take a few questions. So you can raise your hands if you have any question that you wish to ask to Anthony, and I will open your mic uh, to let you ask it. OK, so thank you for your answers. I will close uh, the poll in five seconds. And close. OK, so let's go to Q&A. Do I see any hand raised? You see on the interface, you have the possibility to click and raise your hand, and I will open your mic one by one. Anyone with a question on, on what we've been discussing today? OK, I see one coming from Stefan. OK, Stefan, your mic is on. Uh, hello, I'm Stefan Nikolovsky. Uh, I have asked about uh, peak current uh, uh, for USA and uh, for Europe, but uh, I mean, this isn't uh, the main question about peak current, just uh, I'm interested uh, how we can implement uh, in one device to be able to work in Europe and in US and in the US as well. Is it possible? And uh, uh, you said uh, it's hard, but uh, how hard is that? I mean, did we need uh, separate antennas? I also saw there is some antennas which supporting all of those uh, frequencies. But uh, can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I can say uh, definitely. Thanks. It's a, it's a really good question. So actually, as the device that you saw, the Sensit, is actually multi-zone. It's actually working in the US, in Europe, uh, and I think in, in different zones. And uh, there is a software switch to actually uh, change the zone. The, so how why I said it was complex is that today you don't have modules which implement these different uh, radio zones. So you have to take a solution like a transceiver, like a, a TI transceiver, mm -hmm. okay. and implement everything by yourself. Uh, so, for example, so yeah, the sensit is a perfect example. We, so, you, you know, we, we we only could only ch uh, choose the TI chipset for, for to do that. Uh, so, this is the first thing. The Sigfox module, let's say, uh, is a problem for now. The second thing is the antenna. Uh, you can actually have the same antenna to achieve multiple zones. Uh, so, again, the sensit antenna is optimized for 868 megahertz, 902, uh, 923. So, you can <laughs> the same antenna works for these three zones. But it was really, really, let's say, complex to design. It was, uh, it was a complexity in the design which was not um, that's easy to handle. So uh, this is uh, not impossible. But mm -hmm. you have a lot of different uh, complexity uh, to understand before to, to go into that. It will be, let's say, solved partially in a in, uh, in couple of months because we have partners which will come up with modules which will work in different zones. So it will be easy to implement because, uh, because you will have modules which will do one, two, three, and four, and so, so all the four zones. So this part will be set up. Uh, that will be okay in a couple of months. For now, it's not yet done. Uh, and for the antenna, as the problem will still stay, but I guess you can actually work that out as well. So this is not impossible, but it's not as easy as only doing one device for one zone. Uh, you can send me an email after that if you want to know more. And just for you to, um, to know, uh, we'll do, uh, I think, a webinar on that topic in a couple of months, I think, on the Monarch uh, service. Uh, it, so you, we also have solutions dedicated to do that. So, uh, but even, again, it's even more complex, so it's, uh, it's a bit different. But uh, I think you have my email somewhere. You can send me an email, and I, will, I, will, uh, I can answer you uh, offline about that uh, and some hints and some, some beginning of solutions for, for your problem. Thanks, Anthony, and, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of uh, press release, releases as well as a, a news article in the Adoption Newsletter will also highlight the availability of such feature. So I will yeah. now take a question from uh, Thomas. Thomas, uh, 
Wait. Your hey, mic is on. It's Thomas here. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, hi, it's Thomas here from uh, Switzerland. Yeah, thank you very much for the for this uh, intro. Um, my question <clears throat> is um, regarding if, if basically the same kind of webinar would be held by a, a competitor in that in the LPWA spectrum, i.e., LoRa. Obviously, LoRa also has a lot of devices and so forth. Um, is would they basically? convey the same message as you do, i.e. that if you stick to prefabricated components, then the actual difficulty of designing and creating a device is not too high and one could very quickly arrive at some solution. That That's kind of, in other terms, the message I get. Would they hear the same thing when they when you'd have to do the same thing with Laura? Or uh, is there also from a perspective of manufacturing uh, hardware and, and devices, is there a, what's the word, a disadvantage of sort? So regarding pure hardware, uh, this is mm -hmm. very, very similar. The antenna is mm -hmm. exactly the same, work both with mm -hmm. LoRa and Fox. batteries mm -hmm. are the same, casings are the same. Uh, actually, we, we, you know, there are some devices which do LoRa and Sigfox at exactly the same time. We have, mm -hmm. you know, so let's say from a hardware perspective, there is not so much difference. Uh, from a software perspective, it's very different because the firmware of a, a LoRa device is way more complex. Uh, the firmware of Sigfox device is very, very simple. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Uh, you only, as I, as I stated, you only uh, need a couple of lines of code to send to your modules and you know, send that to, to, your, to the Sigfox network and, and be retrieved, etc. On LoRa, it is very, very different and very, very complex. So uh, mm -hmm. for the pure hardware part, uh, I would say this is very similar. Uh, you take a module uh, from LoRaWAN or Sigfox. Uh, it's very simple to start with uh, with hardware. Uh, from the software, it's very different. And again, here uh, my message here to, to be completely honest. I mean, I, I wanted here to to explain what are the key components, etc. But uh, the message here, I don't want to I don't want everybody to think that oh yeah, I can do hardware. Hardware is very very hard to do, and there mm -hmm. is a lot of complexity in doing such a device that support and and getting able to get that into volumes. And uh, so it's very, doing hardware is very, very complex. So here I just, I wanted to explain, you know, to pick some yeah, no, sure. from it, it's, it's uh, very good, but um, don't uh, don't think that doing hardware is simple because it's it's far from being the truth. And it's it's true for everybody. Doing hardware is hard. <laughs> but, but can I just uh, just uh, expand? So if, uh, if, for example, for certain applications, certain use cases, there are some very nice, um, LoRa uh, hardware is LoRa hardware available? Then it, I could fairly easily, uh, what's the word? Maybe debug it and and put a different code in, and then I have a Sigfox device. Uh, the device maker can. Uh, we have device makers which do LoRa device, which can do switch to Sigfox. No problem. I mean, uh, mm. the, uh, so because uh, again, we are hardware agnostic. So everybody can do, I mean, uh, they can take yeah. the Sigfox stack and implement that into uh, a LoRa device. It, it will transform it into a Sigfox device. There is 98% of chance that it will work. It's a mm. complex work to be transparent, but it will work. But only the device maker can do it. Uh, you can't, yes, but, but you, as a user, can't take a, a LoRa device. And sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can, can. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, now I will take a question that was written by John uh, in the, the chat window. Can we only use products that are fully certified? What happens if we use a development or evaluation kit and generate a product for the market, like the SciPy Dave Ball? Um, so you can, I mean, this is not optimal. Um, to certify a device, I mean, to use, uh, let's say, it's, it's a very complex question to answer, to be transparent with you. Um, you can actually use evaluation kits like the SciPy, uh, uh, you know, and, and use it and develop some prototypes, you know, go to 20, 30 devices just to try the use case, uh, but not, not a problem. Um, but then if you want to do a complete professional solution that you want to sell to people, to customers using a dev kit, uh, to be honest, is not the best solution because it's quick and dirty, but then um, it's it's a problem to go into really mass volumes. 
for, for PyCom, it's a bit different because PyCom, the really good thing is that you can take their modules, you know, uh, the, 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 the SciPy module, and you can put that into your own PCB and do your own industrial design. So this is what I would advise you, is that if you want to work with SciPy, you can work with the dev kit and, and develop your code for the SciPy, and then you can buy from, from, from PyCom. Uh, I think now they are doing the LoPy 4 module, the low, the, the low pi, which I don't know the, the name, but it, it will, which will embed Sigfox, and then put that into your hardware and, and develop it this way. Um, because if you want to buy, if you want to do commercial products based on dev kits and the whole dev kits, like Arduino or PyCom, uh, I, I would not say, uh, I wouldn't advise it to do to it for you. I mean, I wouldn't advise it. But again, I mean, if you want, I mean, we'll, we will not limit it on the backend side. Uh, the, you know, you, 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 we will not block it to be transparent with you on the, on the Sigfox side. It's up to you. But uh, the advice would be not to do that uh, completely. <laughs> uh, but if you want to do prototypes, I mean, that's the way to do. If you want to do 20 or 30 to do a POC or whatsoever, you can use a SciPy and, and it will work the same. Okay, thank you for this answer. There is another one from uh, Bastien. Hello, Anthony, I have a question. Is it necessary to buy IAR license to start developing a proof of concept? Haha, <laughs> uh, that's a very tricky one, and I'm lucky I know what IAR is. Uh, so, so for everybody uh, in the audience, IAR is a compiler uh, to, to actually compile the code, etc. So uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, if you want to start to work with on CMI product, it all depends on the, uh, let's say, the Sigfox modem that you want to work with. If some actually modem makers uh, require us to have IAR, some of them don't. Uh, so it all it only depends on on the on the solution that you want to build. Uh, I I think we we had solution we had version of our libraries which were up, compiled with other things with IAR. To be honest, I don't know where it's uh, now. And I don't want to 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 disclose any <laughs> things which I'm not supposed to disclose, so I have no clue. Uh, so send me an email, and I will find the the, the timing for that. But uh, no, you're not you don't have to use IAR to do Sigfox. It's depending on the module, etc. And I think we we passed that uh, since a while ago. So send me an email again. I will find the best solution, uh, the best answer. Sorry, but I don't find I don't I don't think uh, it's true. Thank you for the answer. If there is no further question yet, there's one that just came from uh, Walter. And I want to precise to Raphael that is doing research on Sigfox that we will put you in touch with our university manager for, uh, uh, for uh, your studies. Um, so Walter's question is this one. In your presentation, you say that Brazil is in RC4. But I'm in Joinville, uh, Santa Catarina, uh, and this is in RC2. And you're actually right, uh, Walter. Uh, Brazil started in RC4 and switched uh, to RC2 because the band, the license band, is wide enough. And uh, this is a business decision from the maker, from, from the operator, sorry. Uh, they wanted to benefit uh, from the ecosystem of the US. So, so uh, the, yeah, yeah, your, your answer is completely true. Uh, but uh, you look at my slide. The Brazil it is in RC2. Maybe it was a, uh, a problem for my what I said. But no, no, Brazil is in RC2. Uh, I said that the rest of LATAM is RC4. Brazil is RC2. And yes, for the reason that you mentioned. So uh, maybe it was a problem from from me talking about it. But uh, no worries. There is no no problem with that. It's it's RC2. Okay, any, any last question before we, we close the, the webinar? Uh, any, any hand uh, raised? No? Okay, so thank you very much to everyone for attending the, the webinar and uh, we hope to see you on June 4th at 5 p.m. Uh, to discuss about the SDR dongle with our yeah. head, of, uh, head of developers. And uh, thanks, everybody. If you want to actually find me on and ask me questions, uh, you can ping me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Uh, so if, if, you, if you don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Arabaz, A-N-T-H-O underscore. <laughs> I've entered on, on Twitter. So if you want to ask me questions, you can actually ask me questions there. I will answer directly to you. So 
thanks everybody and uh, yeah have a good day